Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering AWS reInvent 2019. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services and Intel, along with its ecosystem partners. We're back at AWS reInvent. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host, Justin Warren. This is day one of AWS reInvent. Rob Lee is here, he's the Vice President and Chief Architect at Pure Storage, and he's joined by Rob Walters, who's the Vice President and General Manager of Storage as a Service at Pure. Robs, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for having us back. You're yep, welcome. Thank you. Rob, we'll start with, Rob Lee, we'll start with you. So, reInvent, uh, this is the eighth reInvent, I think the seventh for theCUBE. Um, what's happened at the show, any key takeaways? Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, it's, uh, it's great to be back. We were here last year, uh, obviously, big launch of cloud data services. Um, so it's great to be back a year in um, and just kind of reflect back on uh, you know, how the year's gone for uptake of cloud data services uh, you know, uh, on AWS. And it's been a banner year, right? So we saw over the last year uh, CloudSnap go GA, Cloud Block Store go GA, um, and you know, just really good customer uptake, adoption, and kind of interest out of the gates. Um, so it's kind of great to be back, great to kind of uh, share what we've done over the last year, as well as you know, just get some feedback and uh, more interest from uh, future customers and prospects as well. So Rob W., with your background in the, in the cloud, what's your take on you know, this notion of storage as a service? How do you guys think about that, and how do you look at that? Sure. Um, well, this is an ever more, um, you know, increasingly important way to consume storage. I mean, we're seeing customers who've been, you know, got used to the model, the economic model, the as-a-service model in the cloud, now looking to get those benefits on-prem and in the hybrid cloud too, which if, you know, you look at our portfolio, we have, we have both there as part of the Pure as-a-service. Right, okay, and then so, Pure Accelerate, you guys announced Cloud Block Store. Yeah, that's when right. we took a GA, right? So we've right. been working with customers uh, in, a, in a protracted beta process uh, over the last year to really refine um, the fit and use cases uh, for tier one block workloads. Uh, and so we took that GA and Accelerate. So this is an interesting, you know, you're, you're, you're a partner, obviously, with Amazon. Yep. I would think many parts of Amazon love uh, Cloud Block Store, because you're using EC2, you're front-ending S3, you're like, yep. you're helping Amazon sell services, and you're delivering you know, a higher level of availability and performance uh, in, in certain workloads relative to EBS. Right? Absolutely. So there's probably certain guys at Amazon that aren't so <laughs> friendly with it. So that's an interesting dynamic, but talk about the positioning of Cloud Block Store, any sort of updates on uptake, what are customers excited about, what can you yeah, share? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I'd say uh, primarily we're most uh, kind of uh, pleased with the variety of workloads and uh, use cases that customers are bringing us into. Uh, you know, I think when we started out uh, on this journey, we saw a tremendous promise for the technology to really improve the AWS ecosystem and customer experience uh, for people that wanted to consume block storage in the cloud. Uh, what we learned as we started working with customers is that um, because of the way we've architected the product, brought a lot of the same capabilities we deliver on our flash arrays today into AWS, it's allowed customers to take us into all the same types of workloads that they put flash arrays into, right? So that's their tier one, uh, you know, mission critical environments, uh, their VMware workloads, their Oracle workloads, their SAP workloads. Um, they're also looking at us from everything from, you know, to do lift and shift, uh, test and dev uh, in the cloud, uh, as well as DR, right? And, and that, again, I think, you know, speaks to a couple things. It speaks to the durability, the higher level of service that we're able to deliver uh, in AWS. Uh, but also the compatibility with which we're able to uh, deliver the same sets of features and you know, have it operate in exactly the same way on-prem in the cloud. Because look, if you're going to DR, uh, the, last time, you know, the last point in time you want to discover that there's a caveat, hey, this feature doesn't quite work the way you expect, is when you have a DR failover. And so the fact that we set out with this mission in mind to create that exact level of sameness, um, you know, it's really paying dividends in, in the types of use cases that customers are bringing us into. So you guys obviously, um Big partner of VMware, you've done very well in that community. So VMware Cloud on AWS, is that a tailwind for you guys? Or can you take advantage of that at this point? Yeah, no, so I mean, I, I, think, um, I think the way I look at it is both VMware, um, you know, Pure, AWS, I think we're all responding to the same uh, market demands and, and customer needs, right? Which at the end of the day is, look, if I'm an enterprise customer, the reality is I'm going to have some of my workloads running on premise, I'm going to have some of my workloads running in the cloud, um, I expect you, the vendors, right, to help me manage this diverse hybrid environment. Um, and I, what I'd say is, you know, there are puts and takes how the different vendors are going about it. 
But at the end of the day, that's the customer need, right? And so, you know, we're going about this uh, through a very targeted uh, storage-centric approach because that's, you know, where we uh, provide service today. Um, you know, and you see VMware uh, going after it from the kind of uh, uh, application hypervisor kind of virtualization uh, end of things. Um, you know, over time, you know, we've had a great partnership with VMware on-premise, um, and as both Cloud Block Store and VMware Cloud uh, mature, you know, we'd look to replicate the same motion uh, with them in, in that offering. Yeah, I mean, to the, to the extent, I mean, you think about VMware moving workloads, you know, with their customers into the cloud, that more mission critical stuff comes into the, to the cloud. That's been a, it's been hard to get a lot of that, those, those workloads in to date. Yep. Uh, and that's maybe the next, next wave of cloud. Rob W, I have a question for you. Is, you know, Amazon's been kind of sleepy in, in storage over the S3, EBS, okay, great. They dropped a bunch of announcements you know, this year. Um, and so it seems like there's more action now in the cloud. What's your sort of point of view as to how you make that an opportunity for, for Pure? The way I've always looked at it uh, is that uh, there's been a way of getting your storage done and delivered on AWS, uh -huh. and there's been the way that enterprises have done things on premise. And I think there was a sort of a, a longer term bet from AWS that so that was the way things would sort of fold towards right. uh, into the public cloud. And now we see, you know, all of the hyperscalers, quite honestly, with um, on-prem, you know, hybrid opportunities, um, you know, with the like outpost today, et cetera. Absolutely, yeah. You know, hybrid is a real thing. It's not just something people said that couldn't get to the cloud. You know, it's a real thing. Um, so I think that actually opens up opportunity from both sides. Uh, true enterprise class features that our enterprise class customers are looking for in the cloud through something like CBS are now available. Uh, but I think you know, at Amazon and other hyperscaler reaching back down into the um, on-prem environments to help with the onboarding of enterprises up into the cloud. Yeah. So the as a service side of things makes, makes life a little bit interesting from my perspective because it's kind of new for Pure to provide that, that storage as a service. Yep. But also for enterprises, as you say, they're used to running things in a particular way. Yep. So as they move to cloud, they're, they're kind of having to adapt and change and yet they don't fully want to. Hybrid is a real thing. There are real workloads that need to perform in a hybrid fashion. So what does that mean for you providing storage as a service? And still, to Rob Lee's point, still providing that consistency of experience across the entire higher product portfolio, because that's, that's quite an achievement. And many other storage providers haven't actually been able to pull that off. Yeah. So how do you keep all of those components working coherently together and still provide what customers are actually looking for? I think you have to go back to what the basics of what customers are actually looking for. Um, you know, they're looking to make smart use of their finances. You know, CapEx potentially, you know, they're moving towards OpEx. That kind of consumption model is growing in, in, in popularity. Um, and I think a lot of enterprises are seeing less and less value in you know, the sort of nuts and bolts storage management of, of old. And we can provide a lot of that through the as a service offering. So we handle the capacity management and monitoring. Uh, we've always done the um, evergreen service subscription, so with software and hardware upgrades. So we're letting you know, their sort of shrinking CapEx budget and perhaps their limited resources work on the more strategically important elements of, of their you know, IT strategies, including hybrid cloud. Rob Lee, one of the things we've talked about in the past is AI. Uh, I'm interested in sort of the update on the AI workloads. Uh, we heard a lot, obviously, today on the main stage about machine learning, machine intelligence, AI, uh, transformations. How's that going, the whole AI push? You guys were first, really, the first storage company uh, to, to sort of partner up and, and deliver solutions in that area. Give us the update there. How's, how's it going? What are you learning? Yeah, so uh, it's going really well. Um, so it continues to be a very strong driver of our flash blade business. Um, and again, it's really driven by, uh, it's a workload that uh, succeeds with very large sums of data. Um, it succeeds when you can uh, push those large sums of data at high speed uh, into modern compute uh, and rinse and repeat very frequently. Um, and the fourth piece, which I think um, is really helping to propel some of the business there is, you know, as enterprises, as customers get further on into the kind of AI deployment journeys, what they're finding is the application space evolves very quickly there, right? And the ability uh, uh, for, you know, infrastructure in general, but storage in particular, because that's where so much data gravity exists, um, to be flexible to adapt to different applications and changing application requirements uh, really helps speed them up, right? So, Said another way, uh, if the application set that your data scientists are using today are going to change in six months, you can't really be building your storage infrastructure around you know, a thesis of what that application looks like and then go replace it in six months. 
Uh, and so that message, you know, as customers have been through now the first, first and a half iterations of that and really started to internalize, hey, you know, AI is a space that's rapidly evolving. Uh, we need infrastructure that can evolve and, and grow with us. Um, that's helping drive a lot of second looks and a lot of business back to us. Um, you know, and, and I would actually tie this back to your previous question, uh, which is, um, you know, the direction that uh, Amazon have taken with some of their new storage offerings um, and how that ties into storage as a service. If I step back, you know, as a whole, what I'd say is, you know, both Amazon and Pure, um, what we see is, you know, there's, there's now a demand really for multiple classes of service for storage, right? Fast is important, it's going to continue to get more and more important, whether it's AI, whether it's, um, you know, low latency transactional databases or some other workload. So fast always matters. Cost always matters, right? And so you're going to have the stratification, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's on Flash, with SCM, TLC, QLC, um, you want the benefits of all of those. What you don't want is to have to manage the complexity of tying and stitching all those pieces together yourself, and what you certainly don't want is um, you know, a procurement model that locks you out or into one of yep. these tiers or in one of these locations. Yep. And so if you think about it in the long term, and not to put words in Rob, the other Rob's mouth, um, where I, I think you see us going with Pure as a Service um, is moving to a model that really shifts the conversation uh, with customers to say, look, you know, the way you should be transacting with storage vendors, uh, and we're going to lead the charge, is class of service, maybe protocol, and that's about it. It's like, where do you want this data to exist? How fast do you want it? Where on the price performance curve do you want to be? How do you want it to be protected? And, and give us room to take care of it from there. That's right, that's right. This isn't about the storage array anymore. You know, you look at the modern data experience message, this is about what do you need from your storage, from a, you know, from a storage attribute perspective rather than a physical hardware perspective, and let us worry about the rest. Yeah, you have to abstract that, that yep. complexity. Yeah. Absolutely. You guys have all, I mean, simple is the reason why you were able to achieve escape velocity along with obviously great product and you know, pretty, pretty good management as well. Uh, but but you'll, you'll never sub-optimize simplicity to try to turn some knobs. I mean, I've learned that following you guys over the years, right? I mean, that's your philosophy. Yep. Yep. No, absolutely, and, and what I'd say is, uh, as technology evolves, as the components evolve uh, into this world of multis, multi-protocol, multi-tier, multi-class of service, um, you know, the focus on that simplicity and taking even more of it on uh, becomes ever more important. Um, you know, and that's a place where, getting to your question about AI, you know, we help customers implement AI. We also do a lot of AI within our own products and our fleet. Um, that's a place where our AI-driven ops uh, really have a place to shine in delivering, you know, that, that kind of best uh, uh, optimization of price, performance, tiers of service, uh, so on and so forth, within the product lines. What are you guys seeing at the macro? Um, I mean, as I say, you've, you've achieved escape velocity, you know, check. Uh, now you're sort of entering the next chapter of, of Pure. Um, you're, the, you're the big share gainer, but obviously growing you know, slower than you had in, in previous years. And part of that, we think, is this part of your fault. You put so much flash into the marketplace. It's given people a lot of headroom. Um, obviously, NAND pricing has been an issue. You guys have addressed yeah. that on your calls. Uh, but still, gaining share much, much more quickly than, than most, who, most folks are, are, are shrinking. So what are you seeing at the macro? What are customers are telling you in terms of you know, their long-term strategy with regard to storage? Uh, well, so I'll, I'll start, I'll let Rob uh, add in. You know, what I'd say is, um, you know, what I'd say is, you know, we, we see in the macro a shift, a clear shift to flash, right? It, we've, we've, called, we've called this shot since day one, right? Um, but what I'd say is that's accelerating. Um, you know, and, and that's accelerating with pricing dynamics, with, you know, and we talked about a lot of the NAND pricing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but in the macro, right, um, I, I think there's a clear realization now that customers want to be on Flash, right? It's just a matter of what's the sensible rate, what's the price kind of curve to get there. Um, and, you know, we see a couple meaningful steps. We saw it, you know, originally with our Flash Array line taking out 15K spinning drives, 10K is really falling. Um, you know, with QLC coming online and, and what we're doing in Flash Array C, um, you know, the 7200 RPM drive kind of uh, in the enterprise, you know, those days are, are numbered, right? Um, and, I, and I think for many customers, at this point, it's really a matter of, okay, uh, how, you know, how quickly can we get there and when does it make sense to move as opposed to does it make sense? Um, in many ways, it's, it's really exciting because if you think about it, the focus uh, for so long has been in those tier one environments, um, but in many ways, the tier two environments are the ones that could most benefit from a use, uh, move to flash. 
because you know a couple things happen there because they're considered lower tier, lower cost. They tend to you know they tend to spread like bunnies. They tend to you know be kind of more neglected uh, parts of the environment, um, and so having customers now be able to take a second look at modernizing, consolidating those environments um, is both helpful from a operational point of view, it's also helpful um, you know, from the point of view of getting them to be able to make that data useful again. I, I would also say that those exact use cases are perfect candidates for an as a service consumption model because we can actually you know, raise the utilization, actually helping customers manage to a much more uh, you know, utilized set of arrays than the overconsumption, underconsumption game they're trying to play right now with their annual you know, um, CapEx cycles. And so, how aggressive do you see customers wanting to take advantage of that as a service, as a service consumption model? Is, it, is we, it mixed or is it like, we want this? There's a lot of customers which are like, we want this and we want it now. Um, we've seen a very good, tr good traction and adoption. Um, so yeah, it, it's a surprisingly um, large, complex enterprise customer adoption as well. Yeah, a lot of enterprises, they've gotten used to the idea of cloud from AWS. They like that model of dealing with things and they want to bring that model of operating on site because they, they want cloud everywhere. They don't actually want to transform the cloud into enterprise. That's right, no, exactly. I mean, if I go back you know, 20 plus years to when I was doing you know, hands-on IT, the idea that you know, we as a team would let go of any of the widgetry that we are responsible for never would have happened. But then you've had this parallel path of public cloud experience and people are like, well, I don't even need to be doing that anymore. And we get better results. Oh, and it's secure as well. Oh, and the list just goes on. And so now, as you say, it, it, you know, the enterprise wants to bring it back on-prem for all of those benefits. One of the other things that we've been tracking, and maybe it falls in the category of you know, cloud 2.0, is this sort of new workload forming, and, and I'll preface it this way. You know, the, the early days, the past decade of cloud, infrastructure as a service has been about, yeah, I'm going to spin up some EC2, I'm going to need some S3, whatever, I need some storage. But, but today, it seems like there's all this data now, and then you're, you're seeing new workloads driven by, uh, you know, platforms like Snowflake, Redshift, you know, clearly, throw in some ML tools like Databricks, yep. and, and it's driving a lot of compute now, but it's also driving insights. People are really you know, pulling insights out of that data. That, I just gave you cloud examples. Are you seeing on-prem examples as well, or hybrid examples, and how do you guys fit into that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think this is a secular trend that was kicked off by open source and the public cloud, uh, but it certainly affects, I would say, uh, the entire tech landscape. Um, you know, a lot of it is just about how applications are built. If you think about, you know, think back to you know, the late 80s, uh, early 90s, you know, you had large monoliths, right? You had Oracle, and it did everything, soup to nuts. Your transactional system, your data warehouse, ERP, cool, we got it all. Um, that's not how applications are built anymore, right? They're built with uh, multiple applications working together, right? You've got, you know, whether it's, you know, Kafka connecting into, you know, some scale-out analytics uh, database, you know, connected into Cassandra, connected, right? Um, it, it's just the modern way of how applications are built. And so, um, whether that's, uh, connecting data between SaaS services in the cloud, whether it's connecting data um, between multiple different application sets that are running on-prem, we definitely see that trend. Um, and so when you when you peel back the covers of that, right, um, you know what we see, what we hear from customers as they as they make that shift, as they try to stand up infrastructure to, to meet those needs, um, is again the the need for flexibility, right? As multiple applications are sharing data. Right, are handing off data as part of a pipeline or as part of a, a workflow, um, it becomes ever more important for the underlying infrastructure, the storage array, if you will, um, to be able to, to you know, deliver high performance to multiple applications. And so the era of saying, hey, look, I'm going to design an, a, a storage array to be super optimized for Oracle and nothing else, like you're only going to solve part of the problem now. Right? And so this is why you, know, you see us taking you know, within Pure um, the approach that we do with um, you know, how we optimize performance, whether it's across Flash Array, Flash Blade, uh, cloud, or Cloud Block Store. Great, excellent. Well guys, we got to leave it there. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE and sharing your thoughts with us. And have a good rest Thanks of the week. Thanks for having us back. All right, pleasure. Thank you. All right, keep it right there everybody. We'll be back to wrap day one. Dave Vellante for Justin Warren. You're watching theCUBE from AWS reInvent 2019. Right back. <laughs>